Hello, friends. I would like to introduce Ilya Stambler, a writer, a scientist, a policymaker. And uh, the title of this lecture is going to be The Multidisciplinary and Multifactorial Foundations and Implications of Aging and Longevity Research. And uh, as far as uh, Dr. Stambler's uh, credentials are concerned, there are indeed many. And uh, he's been a world figure and essentially a face of uh, modern gerontology for many years now. He is a chairman and a chief science officer of VETEC Association, the movement for longevity and quality of life in Israel. He is an outreach coordinator and executive committee member of International Society on Aging and Disease in the United States of America with the special consultative status at the UN, no less, Economic and Social Council. He's also a fellow and policy director of Global Health Span Policy Institute in the USA. And in addition, he's an executive board member of International Longevity Alliance in France. So as you can see, I somehow managed to bring a, a very big gun who has uh, a significant impact on the policy, not in the regional sense, but uh, spanning the entire globe. So without any further ado, I'm giving the podium to Ilya Stambler, PhD. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magomed. It's an honor. Uh, please allow me to share screen uh, so I can show my presentation. And now it's perfect. So we can start the presentation. Um, I will speak a little formally, but I hope I can cover most of the ground I wanted. Indeed, uh, thank you very much, Mogomed, for the invitation and for the introduction. My topic is indeed uh, something a little complex, uh, the multidisciplinary, the multifactorial foundation and applications of aging and longevity. But basically it means that uh, aging is uh, not a simple topic. There are many factors and many implications involved in it. Uh, those who expect a, a simple pill to swallow and live long and healthy will be disappointed. Uh, and I will try to uh, present some of this uh, complexity here in my talk. Uh, my main affiliation, also the place where I got my PhD, is uh, the Department of Science, Technology and Society. So my talk uh, will not be pure science, but also uh, the interconnection between science, technology and society. Uh, we speak about the current perspectives in gerontology, about uh, the extension of health and longevity. What do we actually mean by that? We mean, is it actually possible to extend healthy lifespan? The question of feasibility and the connection to society is straightforward. If it is possible, what will be the social implications? What will it mean for society? Is it desirable for society? And if it is possible and desirable, what should we do? How should we achieve it? If it is not possible and not desirable, how should we stop it? Uh, the main premise of geroscience, you know, there are many uh, different uh, hats for, for this study of aging. There is gerontology and geriatrics, uh, but geroscience specifically uh, relies on the assumption that um, in order to prevent age-related diseases, we have to intervene into the men a risk factor or the main underlying cause, the aging process. You can see that all age-related diseases, uh, all chronic diseases increase in incidence um, and severity with age, which basically means that uh, aging is the main underlying cause. So if we're really serious uh, about uh, trying to prevent age-related diseases, uh, trying to extend healthy life, uh, we will uh, need to learn to intervene into the aging process. This is the main a premise of geroscience and as well as of the health longevity movement at large. And uh, this issue will become more and more relevant as time goes by. Uh, the population is aging rapidly. On the one hand, uh, the life expectancy is increasing, so the proportion of all the people is increasing. On the other hand, uh, uh, the, more, uh, the fertility is declining all over the world. So uh, the, um, uh, the so-called age, uh, burden ratio uh, will be uh, will be shifting 
in the direction of the population aging. So this basically means that uh, there will be more and more older people uh, with disabilities, with age related disabilities, and uh, it becomes a urgent social task as well as a professional task to tackle this this uh, problem, to tackle this growing population. This is why we can expect that uh, the professional interest in this will grow, as well as the uh, number of positions. So I hear I'm addressing uh, professionals or future professionals in medicine and healthcare. So be prepared. Uh, aging is probably what you're going to deal with, um, or a lot of you are going to deal with. Uh, the connection to uh, uh, to the general healthcare is is clear. Uh, even even uh, for the most uh, prevalent age related diseases like uh, cancer and uh, type two diabetes and uh, neurodegenerative diseases and heart diseases. Uh, but uh, now um, in the epoch of COVID, it is becoming even more evident. We see that uh, all the people are the most vulnerable, are the most susceptible uh, uh, to the epidemic. If uh, in young age, in childhood, the mortality is virtually zero, in old age, uh, it can reach 15 and 20% for people above 75, 80. Uh, this is why uh, the older people uh, were the most vulnerable and uh, uh, th that's why there was so much fear for their health. Uh, but uh, then the next logical step would be to understand that if they are vulnerable, they're vulnerable simply because of their aging process. So if we would uh, really want to, uh, to combat uh, the COVID crisis, if we would really uh, want to protect the older people, we would uh, need to tackle the aging process. Uh, so this is a point that, that has been made recurrently uh, in these two years, uh, also by us uh, in, in various uh, forums and various publications, uh, in, in, the, in the public forums, in the scientific papers. Uh, one example is the uh, position paper co-signed by uh, several uh, leading uh, geroscientists uh, from the United States, uh, mainly entitled Geroscience in the Age of COVID-19, which basically makes this point that in order to uh, effectively combat uh, the current epidemic uh, and perhaps also prevent future epidemics and crises, we will need to intervene into the aging process. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, position wasn't accepted widely. Uh, and many people still see the virus uh, separately from the main uh, age related risk factors. Uh, it, this is a story that goes back uh, to his, in history, this, uh, the, the famous opposition between the terrain approach to health and the pathogen approach to health. Some focused on pathogens and some focused on terrain, the susceptibility to, uh, to disease. Uh, somehow it is difficult for us to to connect these two, uh, these two approaches. But if we really want to uh, tackle this epidemic effectively, we'll need to somehow to look both at the uh, pathogens as well as the, uh, as the, as well the terrain, the, the environment, the, the main underlying risk factors. So this is also an important point to make uh, for any uh, future health professionals uh, that to want to, to address uh, the future health crisis epidemics, so just, uh, you know, the, the regular infectious disease, as well as the uh, non-communicable diseases. Uh, what are our sources of optimism? Why do we believe that it is possible to intervene into aging and extend health to longevity? There are several such main sources of optimism. First of all, uh, we see that uh, the human life expectancy is really pliable. Uh, during the last 120 years, it doubled basically from about 40 to 80 in the developed countries. Uh, of course, there is no law in nature that uh, states that life expectancy will always increase. Uh, we see even during those two years of COVID that life expectancy basically declined almost everywhere. Uh, the, as much as mortality increased, the life expectancy decreased because life expectancy is simply another way to state the mortality. So we see that mortality can be increased or decreased depending on the, on the living conditions, on the level of medicine. But uh, it shows that uh, life expectancy is pliable, that it is possible to improve it. There is no law in nature that uh, prevents the increase of life expectancy. Now there is a, a more uh, advanced topic of, of whether life expectancy 
um, uh, of the difference between life expectancy and lifespan, but we will not go into that too deeply in this introductory lecture. Another source of optimism is uh, the general improvement of technology. Uh, whatever people uh, uh, say or do, uh, uh, we see technological advances uh, as well as advances in the basic biology, not just aging, but uh, also other fields almost every day. Uh, so the hope is that uh, these uh, advances will synergize and, uh, and produce results more rapidly than they did, uh, uh, than they did earlier. Uh, even in terms of theoretical biology, we see that there is no law in nature that prohibits uh, the intervention into aging or modification of aging and extension of life. There are organisms in nature uh, that simply do not age. Um, we could even say do not die in the usual sense of this word death. Uh, like uh, like we do, they simply continue uh, by uh, by multiplication by division, such as um, the hydra or the so-called immortal jelly, the tertopsis uh, the um, uh, tertopsis dorni, uh, and uh, we see that in this organism their life course is does not start with uh, uh, with birth and ends with death, but undergoes either uh, a continuous uh, a continuous uh, Development, or as, the, as in the case of uh, immortal jelly, undergo some um, some uh, uh, wave-like undulating changes from uh, from uh, old age to youth, and then again to uh, to old age, which shows that uh, in nature uh, the the forms of aging are various, and uh, also there is no single uh, law of nature that. Uh, prescribes our death or an organism's death. But of course, we understand that we uh, evolved uh, in a certain environment. We do have a certain uh, lifespan uh, that, that developed in the course of evolution, but uh, it is not a limit that, uh, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, absolutely insurmountable. Like in physics, you have uh, the limit that you cannot uh, travel faster than the speed of light. There is no such thing in biology that dictates an absolute limit for the lifespan which shows that uh, in principle, it is possible to extend uh, the lifespan for humans as well. And there are indeed the promising uh, developments in the field of uh, uh, experimental gerontology, in the field of experimental intervention to aging. Uh, it, even now it is possible to, um, uh, to extend the lifespan of, of um, uh, simple organisms like uh, uh, nematode worms, uh, uh, see elegance, uh, many folds, even up to 10 folds, and of uh, uh, more complex organisms like pice uh, by 30, 40 percent, while at the same time uh, counseling their uh, age related diseases uh, through various uh, genetic interventions. There are such proofs of principle, of course, it will be a long uh, run to human applications, but at least uh, there is a proof of feasibility, a proof of principle. It is our goal to uh, uh, translate this proof of principle to, to actual clinic. Also our, our goal is, uh, as scientists as well as uh, uh, activists. But I will um, uh, bring uh, those uh, different aspects later on. Uh, another source of optimism is that uh, the field of gerontology is very young. Uh, the term gerontology was coined in 1903 by the uh, Russian slash French slash Jewish slash other nations uh, biologist Elin Echnikov. Uh, uh, in his uh, seminal work, uh, Etudes on the Nature of Man. In the same work, by the way, he coined the term uh, thanatology, the scientific study of death, which is less well remembered, but uh, it also goes hand in hand with the, with the study of aging. And uh, he proposed that uh, aging is actually modifiable. He proposed, I would say, uh, one of the first truly scientific theories of aging based on histological observations. Of course, there were theories of aging much earlier, uh, like uh, the balance of uh, humors, the balance of elements, you know, air, water, um, earth, and fire. Uh, people believe that uh, when those elements are in balance, uh, the organisms should not age, but when certain, uh, uh, certain elements becomes uh, excessive, there is, a, uh, uh, there is a deterioration in the ensuing death. So they believe that the balance of uh, elements is, is actually what determines of our longevity. So there were th theories like, like that. Uh, Meshnikov suggested uh, probably the first truly scientific theory of aging and death based on observation. 
uh, still uh, he posited the, uh, the, the, uh, the importance of balance. He believed that our longevity is determined by the balance between what he called uh, uh, primitive elements uh, that he designated as uh, uh, putrefactive bacteria, uh, the intestinal bacteria, uh, that we are fighting uh, the, the noble elements, the parenchymal uh, tissues, uh, heart and, and uh, nervous tissues. Uh, so he believed that the, in this balance, in this opposition, that they are uh, originated to the, the longevity of the person. Uh, so the uh, way to extend longevity would be to, on the one hand, mitigate the harmful elements, uh, for example, by probiotics, uh, by probiotic means, and on the other hand, to strengthen the, uh, the noble elements. Uh, so uh, this, was, uh, this was probably the first um, uh, scientific as well as proactive theory of aging that uh, not only described the uh, process of aging, but also suggested some means of interventions. And indeed, uh, to matching of we owe certain uh, specific interventions to aging, like probiotic diets uh, that we still use today. Of course, Mechnikov did not invent yogurt, but uh, thanks to his scientific explanation, uh, he um, uh, the, Yogurt became widely adopted as a as a as a means as a therapeutic means. Uh, not many people know, but also Meshikov and his student Jules Bordet originated cytotoxic serums. Also, as an anti-aging uh, means, uh, which is probably uh, one of the first of the first um, application of systemic immunotherapy. Uh, uh, also, another seminal figure in the field, uh, historical figure Charles Edouard Brown Sicar. Uh, originated the field of therapeutic endocrinology in his uh, very famous uh, experiment of 1889, where he injected himself with uh, extracts uh, from semen and glands of dogs and guinea pigs and reported some rejuvenating effects, uh, improved cognition, improved strength, improved uh, sexual activity. Uh, of course, he died uh, five years after the intervention, so uh, this rejuvenating effect wasn't lasting. Uh, but at least uh, he showed that the, the possibility of, of, of intervention, at least at the function level. So, and uh, in this experiment, in this rejuvenation experiment or aging experiment, he uh, laid down the foundation for all therapeutic endocrinology, for the actual intervention to uh, hormonal system of humans with therapeutic purposes. So we see on the one hand, yes, after 120 years, we don't have uh, a pill uh, uh, to cure aging, as they say, we don't have some um, magic uh, magic potion that uh, that we can uh, cheaply buy and um, and uh, live indefinitely. But the, the, those those studies were not futile. In those studies, uh, uh, a lot of uh, very practical interventions were born. So uh, we we need to balance both uh, the practical advances with uh, with uh, shorter term effects uh, with uh, uh, less significant effects, as well as keeping in mind the main goal of intervention into aging, significant life extension as those uh, authors did. Um, so the source of optimism here is yes, uh, 120 years passed since the establishment of the field of gerontology. Uh, we don't have appeal, we have some um, uh, incremental advances, but uh, we have to remember that it's uh, 120 years. We can imagine what, happened, uh, what can happen in the next 120 years. As you know, uh, Mechnikov uh, invented, uh, the, you know, received his Nobel Prize for the uh, discovery of phagocytosis uh, for the foundation of the cellular theory of immunity. Basically before Mechnikov, we didn't know that cells played any part in immunity or in aging, you know? <laughs> that, that was the state of science uh, about 130 years ago. Uh, and now uh, after 130 years, we begin to program uh, uh, immune cells uh, for specific response. So quite a lot of progress was, uh, was uh, made in this time. We can imagine that even if we advance in the same uh, speed uh, in the next um, few decades, uh, we can expect more and more advances, more practical advances. Uh, now we get to the, to the point, well, what, what do we actually mean by age? What, what is it thing that we want to intervene, that we want to improve? Uh, what is it? Uh, everything ages, everything uh, changes with time. So you can say that absolutely every process uh, uh, shows signs of aging. Uh, that's why there's a huge difficulty in uh, defining uh, uh, aging as, as, a, as a biological process uh, or selecting the most relevant process. 
This has been an ongoing uh, struggle since Meshinka for 120 years. People suggested uh, dozens and hundreds of theories of aging, uh, uh, what is aging and what causes aging. Uh, uh, for example, one of the earliest uh, catalogization efforts was done by the, um, uh, by the uh, Moldavian uh, gerontologist Dimo Kotsovsky in the, in the 30s. So he proposed a few dozen uh, theories, not proposed, uh, cataloged a few dozen theories of aging that were available by his time. Uh, the, then uh, George Zaker in the 1960s an American uh, gerontologist uh, proposed uh, the main classification system that we use even now, uh, the classification of uh, so-called stochastic theories of aging, uh, the, the uh, theories that, uh, that based on increasing tau and, and on the entropic process uh, as opposed to programmed, uh, uh, programmed aging, uh, aging based on some genetic program, as also opposed to evolutionary theory that uh, does not exactly explain mechanism, but, uh, but shows how aging emerged um, in, uh, in the course of evolution. So that's the basic classification that is still very prevalent, especially the, the opposition between stochastic and the program theories of aging. Uh, in 1990, the, um, the, the Russian uh, slash British uh, gerontologist, Shoros Medvedev, uh, he was born and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, did most of his career in Russia, but then emigrated to, to the UK. Uh, he, uh, uh, he counted about 300 theories of aging available by his time, uh, by the 1990s. Uh, so he classified uh, them um, in various ways according to the methodology that was used uh, to, uh, to, uh, to study this process. So uh, you know this, uh, this joke uh, uh, of a person who, who lost the keys. So why do you look, why are you looking for the keys uh, near the, uh, near the Near the lantern, near the near the lamp, you know, because it's it's more light here. So basically, the the tears were classified according to the lamps near which uh, the um, uh, the keys were looked for. Uh, so you have um, uh, evolution theories. They were based on the methodologies that compared uh, uh, compared the life courses of different animals. Uh, you have. Um, uh, aging change theories that basically track the, uh, the aging changes in different systems and, and, and compare them in the older versus younger people. You have uh, the, um, uh, the primary cause of damage theories uh, uh, that, that basically try to, to select the most, uh, the most significant uh, uh, set of, of, uh, of uh, causes of aging, of, of, of factors, uh, uh, and uh, that will also allow uh, their manipulation. Uh, you don't have to accept this uh, this classification, but it shows that the aging is a complex uh, is a complex uh, phenomenon uh, that that is very difficult to classify, and also very difficult to, to define. And according to the intervent, we could uh, con uh, compare it to the famous uh, um, fable about the blind man and the elephant. Each person is, is looking at the elephant from a, from a different perspective, uh, so it is difficult uh, to, to see the, the entire elephant. Uh, but somehow we will get to uh, to 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 integrate. <clears throat> and now uh, in the 1910, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in this century, in the 2010s, I would say, in the, the second decade, they emerged uh, three major classification um, uh, systems. Uh, they would correspond to what uh, Medvedev called the primary uh, cause of damage theories. Uh, so uh, they, they tried to select uh, the most important factors to determine our aging that would uh, be the, the appropriate targets for intervention. So uh, these uh, classes include uh, the, uh, the famous uh, uh, strategies for engineering negligible senescence by Aubrey de Grey that uh, basically listed uh, seven such main causes, uh, such as cell loss and cell atrophy, uh, death-resistant cells, oncogenic nuclear mutation, and et et mutations, uh, uh, mitochondrial mutations, uh, intracellular aggregates, extracellular aggregates, intracellular crosslinks, we see he selected uh, a, a set of, of uh, specific aging processes that were all known uh, for, for decades before and said, th these are the main uh, process of aging. Uh, uh, we could intervene into them and also proposed uh, some, some specific means of intervention. And there were similar attempts a little later on, such as the, uh, uh, the classification system by um, uh, Carlos Lopez Otten, uh, 
um, called the Hallmarks of Aging that is massively quoted in the scientific literature and gerontological literature probably uh, thousands of times. Uh, but the idea is, is, is similar to select the main aging processes by their view, uh, such as uh, genetic instability, uh, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, um, uh, loss of proteostasis, uh, stem cell um, uh, depletion, and so on. And for each, they found that there are uh, feasible uh, uh, interventions to, to somehow ameliorate those processes uh, based on animal models, on cell cultures. So this was their classification. And another uh, classification this use the same approach uh, to divide aging into the main uh, the main um, uh, process is uh, by the so-called NIH Geoscience Interest Group, a group from all the 27 institutes of the NIH, people who are interested in aging. So in um, uh, 2013, they came up with a position paper that named uh, the following seven uh, uh, main processes of aging such as adaptation to stress, epigenetics, inflammation, macromolecular damage, uh, metabolism, proteostasis, uh, stem cell uh, uh, or regeneration process. Uh, those are according to this, uh, those um, uh, uh, the scientists are the main uh, process involved in aging. And for each, we have um, uh, proofs of principle of intervention. If it's adaptation to stress, we have certain drugs that can uh, uh, modify our adaptation to stress. If it's epigenetic, we have various kinds of uh, epigenetic drugs uh, like methylating agents, uh, transcription factors. If there is inflammation, we have um, a, a huge assortment of uh, anti-inflammatories or immunomodulating um, uh, drugs. If it's macromolecular damage, uh, we have uh, various means uh, for uh, DNA repair, uh, even in traditional medicine. Uh, if it's metabolism, there are also certain uh, interventions that can modify it, like uh, uh, mTOR uh, inhibitors, uh, for example, rapamycin, a very, very famous uh, proteostasis, there are various autophagy inducers, stem cells, um, uh, we have uh, various uh, cell therapies. So for each uh, such process of aging, the process of intervention. So you see it is also a little bit similar to, the, to looking for, uh, for a key near, near the lamp. Uh, or, or maybe the other way around, uh, you have uh, a specific process and way to intervene. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice uh, number seven or nine, uh, but uh, they could be 17 or 99 because once again, everything uh, changes with age. Uh, so if you focus on, on particular uh, processes, uh, there'll be different classifications, but uh, at least uh, these are the, the classifications that are most uh, widespread right now. Uh, here's another uh, original classification uh, that, that I published. Uh, for example, it divides uh, the main um, interventions into process of uh, subtraction versus addition. Uh, the idea goes back to Meshnikov, uh, who spoke about balance, about uh, adding the uh, noble elements while subtracting the, the primitive elements. But uh, you have various means to, to add uh, matter or versus um, uh, remove matter, and you can build a classification based on that. There are all kinds of classification that can be created. Uh, at least uh, we need some some way to, to handle the, all the existing um, all the existing uh, uh, pro aging process and and uh, means of intervention. Uh, but at least the main point is that yes, there are certain aging process and there are certain interventions that can um, ameliorate those process. So there is a clear proof of feasibility of intervention into aging and extension of healthy life. Uh, but uh, now the problems begin. Well, the one big problem is the problem of, uh, of integration, once again, of balance, uh, because uh, once again, uh, uh, the, there could be seven processes of aging or 17 processes of aging. In traditional medicine, you usually have five or four or three uh, main processes or uh, main factors that you are supposed to integrate to bring to balance like the three, dosha, three doshas in the Indian traditional medicine or the five elements in the Chinese traditional uh, medicine. So basically, um, uh, in traditional me Chinese medicine, if you have, uh, let's say, an example, uh, a deficiency in fire. So uh, the, the physician diagnoses you that your, your hands are cold. You probably have a deficiency of fire. You have to uh, eat some pepper. So you increase your fire in this way, you bring your organism into balance and, and prolong, uh, prolong your, your, your existence. But uh, what if, uh, the, what if the, the system looks like this, like in the, the right panel? 
uh, what are you supposed to eat uh, in this case? Um, and uh, how do you bring this system into balance? So um, it is not um, a simple uh, question to, to integrate the various processes to bring them into, into a system. Uh, and this is simply formulated uh, by uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the leaders of modern gerontology, Alexander Korf Comfort, uh, the, uh, the author of, uh, of uh, one of the most um, uh, influential work on, on, on senescence. Uh, in one of his articles, he compared uh, the situation to um, adding a, um, a faulty component in an old radio, which may restore voltages to the correct original levels but blow out several other components which can no longer stand them. So if you are creating intervention to aging, you have to look at the entire picture because indeed you can um, uh, uh, add a, a new component that will make some part of, of, uh, of, the, of the circuit you work, but blow up all the others. So we have to be very careful about that. Uh, so his conclusion was that uh, we will need to, uh, to intervene uh, uh, into the entire aging process and failing in radical intervention, interference with the whole process of aging, uh, will not be able to, to extend life significantly. So also uh, for you as future researchers, medical researchers, biological researchers, it will be important to integrate the, the various aspects. Um, and another um, uh, issue is uh, how do we exactly measure aging? Uh, we said that everything ages, uh, so what is it exactly that we measure? We know that, that science uh, begins with measurements. Uh, we cannot uh, intervene into something that we cannot measure, or you cannot cure something that you cannot diagnose. So in order to, uh, to uh, treat or, or intervene into aging, we have to have a set of clinical criteria. What is it exactly that we measure? Uh, and what is it exactly that we modify? Here again, like, uh, again, like with theories of aging, this, vast multitude of approaches, uh, as well as vast multitude of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of metrics, of, um, of indicators, because once again, everything changes with age. So every single process can be a biomarker of age. age. Uh, you have functional markers like muscle strength and, and balance and functional mobility and, and uh, the psychological tests. So that's uh, the things that usually geriatricians measure in the geriatric assessment. Uh, the things that are not so expensive uh, to measure that can even be based on um, on self-evaluation, on uh, on some uh, surveys, uh, as well as some simple functional measurements. Uh, and then you have the the biological structural measurements that are usually uh, uh, treated as biomarks of aging, which can be very expensive, very complex, like uh, telomere lengths and and glycation end products and uh, biomarks of oxidative stress and epigenetic measurements. And whatnot, uh, so uh, it is even difficult to imagine how all these uh, biomarks will be used massively on a global population. But at least you know it's important to uh, uh, to to study them uh, both uh, both simpler measures and uh, and more more um, involved, more uh, advanced measures to 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 uh, to be able to evaluate aging uh, in order to test the effectiveness of, of intervention. Uh, so. Uh, but uh, the main idea remains that uh, whatever the cause those complexities, so whatever the, the exact uh, the metrics we have or the exact theories we have, the, the idea is very intu intuitive that if we want to uh, prevent age-related diseases, we have to intervene into the main uh, risk factor of or underlying cause, which is the aging process. And uh, we can build on that. With this basic consumption, with this basic premise, we can already uh, build uh, more and more um, involved theories. And uh, this is a point uh, that, uh, that has been increasingly recognized uh, up to the point that aging is now included into the international classification of diseases of the World Health Organization. Uh, also thanks to, to, to activism uh, of, 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 of some of the organizations that, that I was involved in and others. So uh, finally, aging is included into the international classification of diseases, not as a disease, uh, but in two, um, in two categories, first as a general symptoms or general symptomatics and as a cause of disease, as a causality or as a theology. Uh, so there, there are basic ways to intervene into aging according to ICD right now, but uh, then they will start the, the work of actual, uh, uh, of, of actually building the evaluation criteria that will be the actual endpoints that will allow us to, uh, to, to address this, uh, this condition. And uh, we also published on that. I, I, uh, I 
bring some of our works, quote some of our works, not because uh, because of vanity, because we actually published quite quite a lot about it. Uh, but once again, the uh, the main point I'm trying to make also for you as as a, as a medical uh, a practitioner, as medical researchers, is the the necessity of evaluation criteria. There are currently no agreed evaluation criteria for aging, uh, or even for age-related multimorbidity. Uh, what is it that actually that we measure? What is it that we diagnose? Like in every other disease, uh, cancer, uh, heart disease, we have uh, established uh, evaluation criteria or symptoms. What are the symptoms of aging? What do we want to uh, to fix? So this will be uh, the work uh, for the next uh, for the next uh, uh, not to say generation, but uh, for the next uh, few years to establish what is it exactly that we want to. Uh, uh, to, to fix the, the, the need for evaluation criteria. It is not such a simple question. You know, we don't even currently, we don't even have the, the grid uh, uh, understand what is it exactly that we want to treat uh, if we treat aging as a medical condition. Are we actually treating a disease or is it a syndrome or a polysyndrome or risk factor underlying cause? Uh, is it uh, a predictor of frailty? Is it a predictor of disease? Is it a predictor of death? Is it the correlate of, uh, of chronological age? We do not have an agreed definition, so it will be a huge work for consensus building, uh, but uh, we will need to do this work in order to, uh, to be able to arrive at some kind of common language um, in order to, to intervene into aging. Um, and then there the arise uh, various other uh, complicating factors. Uh, when we are um, uh, making this consensus discussion, uh, then we'll have to understand about the um, uh, declarative definitions. Uh, uh, we need to minimize the confounding factors when we select uh, biomarkers of aging. We will need to see their informative values, which biomarkers are the most predictive for certain diseases, uh, which of them uh, show efficacy, which of them show, uh, show safety, uh, we will need to think of their practical utility. You know, fine, we will have a biomarkers of aging that, that, that are most predictive uh, for, for age-related disease, but uh, perhaps they are too costly to, to, even, uh, to even apply them in any significant uh, number of people. So it's basically useful for, for, any, for any healthcare purposes. So we'll also need to think about accessibility, the cost-effectiveness, affordability, standardization, uh, all these are, are issues that will need to, uh, to, be, uh, to be evaluated. So hopefully you as, as future resources will also contribute to, to, this, uh, to this discussion. Of course, uh, this, this was uh, our um, uh, set of, of, of criteria. There are other evaluation criteria, or other, um, other principles of selection. For example, uh, the, uh, the one by Alexey Moskalov uh, and, and others which uh, suggested primary selection criteria for potential germ protectors, like increasing lifespan, as well as secondary selection criteria, like uh, uh, evolutionary conservatism, increases stress resistance. Uh, there is also a, uh, a, a, a evaluation uh, system by the American Federation for Aging Research uh, that, that uh, say that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, biomarks of aging have to predict the remaining life expectancy and monitor, monitor mechanism and be, be subject to repeated tests and be testable in both laboratory animals and humans. You can see uh, that those uh, criteria are, uh, I wouldn't say arbitrary, but at least, you know, they're probably not the only possible ones. So uh, uh, we will also need a broader discussion of the criteria that we want to have in order to intervene into aging or, or that we can use to, to practically intervene into aging. Uh, currently, the, the most practical uh, approach for intervention to aging, I would, I would uh, argue, is the one proposed by uh, Nir Barzilai, an American uh, uh, gerontologist uh, from the Albert Einstein uh, Institute in New York, uh, who proposed uh, the, the famous study TAME, targeting aging with, with metformin. Uh, uh, metformin is a well-known uh, anti-diabetic drug, probably known for, for 70 years. Uh, but the, the novelty, the innovation of uh, near Barzilai was to suggest this uh, drug not uh, uh, as a drug for specific condition, but for several conditions at once. Uh, the so-called age-related multimorbidity, 
because he claimed that if we are able to show the, uh, the delay in the onset of several age-related conditions like diabetes and heart disease and neurodegenerative disease, then we uh, can uh, be pretty sure that we intervene into aging, intervene into the main risk factor for all those conditions. So uh, by those proxy measures that we know how to diagnose that, that, that are acceptable in medical practice, we can actually test the intervention to age. I believe this is uh, still the most practical approach in the absence of any agreed um, uh, evaluation criteria for aging. Uh, that's uh, that what we can do, that it can be done in almost any clinical, clinical setting. And uh, on the basis of this uh, instrumental practical approach, uh, there they were other initiatives, uh, for example, here in Israel, there, were, there was this uh, call for research proposals on the new approaches toward error diagnostic, uh, diagnosis and prediction of old age multimorbidity and evaluation of the aging process and determinants for multimorbidity. So uh, various, uh, various studies were suggested under this principle. Uh, but of course, uh, there may be, uh, there could be a vast discussion yet, but at least, you know, in, in practical terms, uh, we can uh, always measure the, the delay in age related disease. Um, and uh, uh, the, there could be many, many uh, approaches to, um, uh, to study it. Uh, I, I gave a very partial list of potential uh, anti-aging uh, treatments of potential uh, geroprotective treatments. Uh, uh, one could focus on, for example, mesenchymal stem cells uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, were shown to um, improve some of the, of the inflammation uh, 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 factors of aging, the so-called inflammaging. But of course, there are many questions to arise in terms of uh, longer term efficacy. But this is just one example of the, of the practical intervention approach that we can test. But of course, there are many others. And in terms of, uh, of uh, diagnosis, that was in terms of treatment. In terms of diagnosis, it is also very important to have uh, a, an available set of, a, a large available set of data on age related changes. Uh, preferably longitudinal changes, but if not, then uh, cross-sectional changes that we can compare and uh, create correlates of aging and disease. And in this way, probably create some practical means to, to diagnose aging. I'm uh, quoting some of our um, uh, efforts in this, in this area, but of course there are many others. And uh, all together, we will hopefully contribute to this general um, evaluation paradigm of aging. Uh, so that was the, the more scientific part, but of course nobody canceled the, uh, the, 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 the life part until all those uh, evaluation criteria become available, until uh, we, we, we learn to integrate diverse aging processes. For now, we can all use uh, what, uh, what uh, we know, what uh, all our, our grandparents knew, all those interventions like sleep and exercise and moderate and balanced nutrition, life-affirming attitude, uh, you don't have to be a great scientist to, to practice this, uh, but hopefully uh, with more research, uh, we will understand also how these ones works, that are proven to work, uh, to extend healthy life. Uh, and uh, we should not eliminate one uh, at the expense of the other. We shouldn't say, you know, uh, we don't care about, uh, about the lifestyle approaches, uh, we just do science, or, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't need science, but uh, we can just all uh, uh, eat uh, healthy and then and, and sleep. Uh, the, we, we need to integrate the different approaches to with the, the common goal of extending healthy longevity. And then uh, if I have time, uh, I would go to some of the, uh, of the social implications of this, of this research, because I hope by now I showed you that, uh, yes, it is possible to intervene into age. There are various approaches. There is no uh, agreed uh, uh, intervention. There are no, no agreed in evaluation criteria. So we don't have a very specific pill that you can swallow, but at least there are many directions that show that yes, intervention into aging is possible, the extension of healthy life is possible. Now we need to understand if it is possible, uh, uh, do we actually want it? Does our society need it? How do we deal with it when it, when it arrives? And here we go to the realm of ethics, uh, both individual ethics uh, and uh, social ethics. Uh, both uh, uh, utilitarian ethics and deontological ethics. Uh, uh, these are also quite um, uh, involved issues. Uh, basically, we can uh, divide them into uh, several sets of questions. One is principle. Is uh, life extending treatments even desirable? Uh, often when you raise this topic with people, uh, you will hear no. 
from the start, not desirable. We don't want to live longer. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, look, look for another job. Uh, uh, but if you, uh, if you overcome this resistance, if you actually explain to people that uh, living longer is a good thing, uh, then we go to the practical, um, uh, practical ethical questions. Uh, 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 what, what are the actual ethical rules to conduct the anti-aging studies? Who should be the target audiences? Um, uh, how those uh, treatments will be distributed? To whom? Under which conditions? Uh, so um, these are also become will also become uh, uh, topics for future consultation and future research. Uh, I can go very briefly into this. Uh, uh, basically, in the first uh, category of questions, is life extension even desirable? Uh, do do we even want it? Yes, we want it, uh, but we don't always admit to it. Uh, so this uh, uh, this desire was expressed by many uh, philosophers, many great philosophers religious philosophers like the, the, the great Jewish uh, philosopher Maimonides, uh, who said that basically there are no uh, limitations the human lifespan, that if we uh, keep our uh, out of harm's way, we actually be able to extend life indefinitely. Uh, the, the one quote I love is by Herbert Spencer, who, the, the founder of, 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 ethic, of ethics, modern ethics, who said that, uh, that uh, longevity corresponds to the optimistic worldview, basically meaning that if you value life, if you think life is a value that you will strive to uh, to extend it, uh, so the, the policy that uh, that uh, that foster extending longevity would be uh, would be praiseworthy on the optimistic view. Uh, so this, of course, also includes war and all the other uh, means of meaning, uh, of killing. Uh, if you value life, on the other hand, it does uh, promote uh, uh, longevity research. And also, Meshnikov that I mentioned earlier has simply said that. Uh, you shouldn't bother about uh, uh, asking the, 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 the meaning of life. The meaning of life is simply to, to live, to live as long and as healthy as possible. Uh, uh, perhaps we will reach some point in life uh, when, uh, when uh, we would actually be full of years in biblical terms that, that, that will be actual limit that will no longer want to, uh, to, to live any longer, but at least we are very far from this point. So at least in our present stand, we, we need to extend life. Um, as much and as possible. And the main misfortune on Earth is that people do not live to that uh, limit and die prematurely. Uh, uh, there are uh, many ex examples of, of uh, such a prolonged philosophy in, among religious uh, thinkers as well as atheistic thinkers. So uh, uh, in case people claim that uh, a prolongation of life is an atheist phenomenon, no, by no means. Uh, uh, there's good agreement uh, uh, also among uh, religious philosophers uh, Jews, Taoists, uh, Christians, uh, Muslims, uh, many of them agree that, uh, that uh, prolongation of life is possible and desirable. Uh, but of course, uh, this is not the entire religious tradition. In every religious tradition, you can find uh, uh, undercards that favor life extension and those who do not uh, favor it. So we will need to find those undercurrents that, that do support life extension and uh, publicize them more, uh, strengthen them more. Uh, I probably don't have much time yet, but um, I'll try to uh, to go quickly. Uh, and indeed, even in practical terms, uh, we see that longevity, that health longevity, is uh, is a very desirable social outcome uh, because simply because it is a correlate of of most human values. Uh, you know the um, the Human Development Index. The, the index of, of, uh, of human development, it, compose, it is composed of three main uh, uh, elements, longevity, education, and income. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, all those, um, uh, all those uh, elements are uh, correlated. So if you increase longevity, you also improve education as well as improve income and vice versa. If you improve income, also have more better education and more, better longevity, same for education. Uh, so if you advance longevity as a proxy, you actually uh, advance uh, most of the human values we have for human development. Uh, uh, so uh, why not choose this, uh, this particular value to advance all of them? Uh, another important point to raise is uh, the uh, distinction of um, so-called general life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Uh, healthy life expectancy is simply a, uh, the number of, of, of years the life expectancy that uh, we live without any uh, de uh, debilitating chronic diseases. 
These are mainly established by self-reports. So uh, these uh, measurements are not uh, very reliable, but it's, uh, they give a good, good indication of uh, the uh, time lived in good health versus uh, the general time lived. Often uh, the argument against uh, uh, longevity is that uh, we do not want uh, the extension of life at the expense of so-called quality of life. You know, don't live to prolong the, the life of disability. Um, but actually we see that uh, with the progress of, 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 uh, of society, both of those uh, of these categories increase, uh, both uh, life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. And of course, our goal is to increase healthy life expectancy as much as possible. Uh, but uh, the, the general life expectancy is not uh, uh, something that we don't want and to, to, to depreciate. So if, if you see even uh, uh, by comparing different countries, you see that the more uh, uh, developed technological advanced countries have uh, greater uh, life expectancy as well as healthy life expectancy, um, such as um, our country, Israel, <laughs> which um, has uh, the general life expectancy of, um, of uh, 83 years uh, and uh, the healthy life expectancy of 83. And other countries, I'm sorry to say, um, uh, like Russia, that they have the uh, general life expectancy of 73, which is uh, the, uh, the world average, and the healthy life expectancy of, uh, of 64. Um, of course, there's much, uh, much uh, a way to progress. And it was even the data for, uh, for 2019. Uh, now in these two years of, of, of the pandemic, uh, those values probably dropped both for Israel and Russia and the entire world. So these are even optimistic values. So we still have a lot of work to do uh, to, um, to improve both general life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Uh, also uh, your task as, as, as health care professionals and researchers will be to, to, um, uh, to improve this, this trends. Uh, but at least uh, it, it, they show that uh, advancement, uh, human advancement, human progress is associated with uh, increasing life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, not the, the, not the other way around. Um, and so longevity can be said to correlate pretty much with every value that, uh, that, uh, that we have. Uh, the valuation of life and peacefulness of education, intellectual activity, prosperity. Um, actually, the Nobel Lord in economics, Amartya Sen, said that mortality is the indicator of economic success and failure. So basically uh, our um, economic success is not measured in some, uh, uh, in some uh, numbers on paper, but in actual uh, uh, mortality of people, how long and um, uh, how well pe people live. Um, so if we want to improve all those values, we will need to, to improve our longevity, as well as equality, the Gini index, uh, safety, all the things uh, correlate uh, very directly with, uh, with human longevity. So longevity is probably the main proxy to, to advance as a, as a human species. Uh, there are various objections to that. It, it sounds uh, obvious. Yes, uh, we all want to live longer and healthier. As we say, better to uh, be healthy and rich than, than poor and sick. Uh, but uh, no, actually, if you raise the possibility of longevity of life extension, you will hear the arguments that uh, increasing longevity will, uh, will uh, diminish change and it will bring stagnation, boredom and suffering. And, uh, and uh, so extension of life is something undesirable. But then you can bring the counter arguments that uh, uh, we do need extended longevity for stability, uh, for the to increase the potentials for learning, uh, that, that we can prevent, prevent suffering, that the life has a meaning of its own. And actually, uh, you can turn the argument around and say that if we do not extend longevity, these are the negative consequences, consequences that, will, that we will face. The, the potential for learning will be diminished, uh, the, that will be more suffering, that uh, we will not be uh, stable as, as, um, as a society. So these are the things that, uh, that we need to, to advance uh, also as, as gerontologists. Uh, another objection that is also raised to, to extending longevity is, uh, is uh, the question, so called question of overpopulation that we will. Uh, Actually, uh, increasing longevity will bring about uh, a total exhaustion of resources. Uh, it has never happened in practice before, never happened in history. We see that uh, actually the developed nations uh, with the increasing uh, longevity, uh, they have no sign of, of um, overpopulation. On the contrary, they have uh, declining uh, fertility and so um, uh, declining population. 
um, and no sign of, of uh, decline in the quality of life. So if we actually want to fight overpopulation, fight, to fight it for shortage of resources, we will need to, to also extend our longevity, uh, even for the simple reason that the technologies that will extend our longevity will also help us overcome other, uh, other global challenges. Uh, and in practical terms, uh, it was uh, it was calculated in the 60s that uh, even with the uh, agricultural technologies available by that time, uh, they could feed uh, about 45 billion people a year. Uh, and since then, the technological, the agricultural capabilities only improved. So we should not uh, fear um, should not fear um, any kind of exhaustion if we do use the right technology. Actually, the famines, uh, the, the, the shortages arrived because we did not use the proper technologies, not because of the technologies. So uh, I, I focus on this because it is important nowadays. Uh, many people are speaking again about overpopulation. They we should uh, stop the population growth, stop the economic growth, stop the, the technological growth. No, if we really want to, uh, to um, combat the existential threat, we need to develop technologies, also medical technologies, agricultural technologies. Uh, that will also allow us to uh, to uh, to use the available resources more effectively. So it's actually it's, it's a quite a significant discussion that we still uh, needs to be made right now. Uh, our main means of sustainability, so called, is to cut, 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 cut. Now we will also need to to, to grow. Uh, and in economic terms, also. Um, uh, uh, the arguments that what would happen if we extended longevity, the bad things that would happen to us. No, we need to realize what will happen to us if we do not um, extend uh, health and longevity. And what will happen to us is that uh, the, uh, the social security and, and uh, healthcare system will probably collapse if, uh, if uh, longevity extended uh, without uh, improving the, uh, the health and longevity. If we are not able to intervene into the aging process, if we are not able to prevent age-related disease, uh, huge losses are expected uh, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from population aging if uh, we are not able to develop uh, a biogerontology, a geroscience fast enough. And on the contrary, if we do able, if we are able to, to develop, then they'll expect huge savings, uh, trillions of dollars um, uh, over a, a few decades just for the United States, um, for, for, for large countries like, like Russia uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Europe probably. Um, in the same order of magnitude. So if we really want to improve uh, um, uh, the healthcare system, uh, social security system, we need to uh, develop preventive intervention to the aging process. So uh, clearly uh, it, it's not uh, probably on the, on the agenda of many people. There are more pressing concerns, but if you look uh, uh, for the longer term perspective, that's something that needs to be done also to, uh, to prevent a short term crisis. And this is the task that uh, should be uh, should be advanced by all. Basically, aging is relevant to all of us. Uh, for those who are already in this in this stage of life, like me, <laughs> and uh, those who are who are, uh, who are entering, or, or are lucky and will be lucky enough to enter, and if, if not yet, then for our parents, for our grandparents, uh, this uh, the the task of extending health and longevity of intervention into aging should be um, important for all of us, for the general public. For the pharmaceutical and medical technology industry, for health insurance, life insurance, regulators, policymakers, and just for the scientists, is a very exciting and uh, significant topic. Um, and nowadays, um, aging is, is not even often on the um, on the curriculum in most universities. Uh, even in biology textbooks, you will not often find uh, the topic of aging. Uh, so this is obviously need to be uh, more 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 present, more prevalent. Uh, so uh, now we, we passed, uh, if I have uh, five uh, more minutes or 10 more minutes, uh, we passed the question of uh, feasibility and desirability. Uh, I hope I showed that uh, it is possible uh, to um, uh, intervene into aging. It, it would be desirable for the society and for us as individuals. And now what do we do with this? If something is possible and something is desirable, how, um, uh, what should we actually do to, to, to get that something that uh, we want and that is possible to achieve? Um, and uh, here, this is the question, not just uh, for, for scientists, for physicians, obviously, if you are a scientist or a physician, you do everything in your power to, to save lives, to, to do more um, a more significant, more um, um, impactful um, research to, to, to create the therapies, but also for the rest of the society, 
it is important to support those studies. Uh, this is also our work as activists. Uh, I'm not just a researcher, I'm also involved in, in various uh, advocacy associations that uh, Magomed mentioned, uh, like the Global Health Spend Policy Institute, International Longevity Alliance, and International Society on Aging and Disease. In those organizations, we um, actually advance uh, policies that would support aging research uh, with this vision that it is possible and desirable for our society to advance this research as fast as possible. Uh, I will go very quickly. The, uh, the social advancement of this topic can be done on, on various levels, on the international level through various uh, framework documents where we'll need to, uh, to introduce the relevant sections in support of aging research and uh, uh, make the policymakers more aware of the sections that are already there. Uh, and in this um, sense, uh, we're actually able to, to introduce some changes even in, in, uh, in some framework work, uh, documents at the WHO level, uh, uh, but I will I'll touch on this later. Uh, uh, we, we can advance uh, aging research at the, at the national level by providing sets of uh, policies uh, that would support aging research. This is a policy paper that we wrote um, at the International Society on Aging and Disease entitled uh, The Critical Need to Promote Research of Aging to Extend Health and Longevity. Um, it was uh, quoted over 200 times in scientific literature, translated to all languages, uh, submitted to several governments. Uh, so basically we propose increasing funding, uh, uh, improving incentives and um, uh, institutional supports uh, for, this, for this research. And this kind of, um, Policies can be adopted basically everywhere with different modifications. For example, uh, a variation of this of this policy framework was adopted here in Israel in the National Master Plan on Aging. Uh, uh, also, at the level of individual organizations, uh, non-profit organizations or for-profit organizations, we can then advance education and awareness, communication support, analysis, and data processing. These are some of the goals of our association. But of course, other um, uh, professional and public associations. Can do uh, can select additional uh, goals and activities, uh, and there are things that every one of us can can advance in his own way or her own way, without the need to wait for the government to adopt this agenda, without uh, you know uh, waiting for the uh, for the for the uh, governmental agencies or, or large institutions to to get on board. Uh, simple things like do more research on aging related issues, study the relevant field, join join uh, like minded people. Uh, participate in research, donate, uh, participate or support lobbying initiatives, and uh, simply just uh, please be healthy until uh, the uh, life extending technologies arrive, as they say, uh, live long enough to live even longer. Uh, so please practice all the usual uh, healthy life prolonging means that, uh, that we know, like nutrition and exercise and sleep and attitude uh, to get a better chance to, to arrive at the technologies, uh, hopefully in the next um, uh, few, decades or years. Uh, I probably should uh, end uh, soon. So I'll just touch on several initiatives uh, that were done uh, to, to promote it, like uh, the um, international um, uh, campaign, educational campaign for longevity research, uh, such as uh, uh, the longevity dividend uh, back in 2006. Also the, the, the campaign, uh, the physical longevity month campaign, um, uh, the longevity research is also advanced at the, the international level. For example, 2017, there was a massive uh, public campaign to include aging and aging health into the work program of the WHO, World Health Organization. It wasn't there. So thanks to this public campaign, this uh, topic was included. Also, as a result of, um, of an advocacy campaign, aging was included in the international classification of diseases that I mentioned earlier also mainly through, the, uh, through, through advocacy, through, through activism. And I'm very happy to be involved in some of those uh, organizations, uh, some of those initiatives. Um, here in Israel, uh, other initiatives are advanced uh, in support of uh, research, development and education for the promotion of health longevity and prevention of age-related diseases uh, that, uh, uh, that include this topic into the Israel Master Plan on Aging and uh, we're actually able to, uh, to create some uh, calls for research proposals uh, in Israel and between Israel and other countries. For example, uh, uh, Biorex Aging, Britain Israel Research and Academic Exchange on Aging, 
that is based on those principles, so on the principles of geroscience, intervention into aging, extension of health longevity. Uh, so here you see that uh, social effort can also uh, influence, uh, influence scientific pursuits. And uh, this is a topic that can be scaled to any dimensions, uh, uh, the same way that the cooperation was established between uh, UK and Israel, in the same way there could be cooperation between Russia and China, or between uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine, or between uh, Israel and Russia, actually, there is an initiative, or what was an initiative to establish an, uh, such a cooperation between um, Israel and Russia, as well as Israel and Ukraine. Uh, so uh, if there is one thing that can unify us, that can, uh, uh, that can bring people together is this pursuit of health longevity. Uh, this is our common survival. Uh, this is uh, the one thing that, uh, that all people want, regardless of their of their belief, of their nationality. Uh, so hopefully that uh, uh, this field will develop uh, both as a social, as a social uh, movement, as well as, as a scientific pursuit. So we can all enjoy uh, the fruits as soon as possible. Thank you. That was an incredibly interesting um, lecture because it presented, <clears throat> is presenting a, a view generally not afforded to a bench scientist. It's much broader. It brings it in a, into a social context concerning the entire humanity. So uh, I want to congratulate you on this uh, massive achievement with the World Health Organization uh, in recognizing aging as a medical condition. Uh, I do have some objections as far as uh, aging as a disease is concerned, but it's uh, it's uh, cosmetic. It's uh, nothing structural. I do love your optimism, uh, especially that um, line about pliability of longevity. You should have uh, added probably within the existing uh, limits of existing design, uh, at least for humans. <clears throat> there is no tangible truth, and as always. Gerontology is um, very proficient in uh, making all kinds of promises, but slightly less proficient in uh, delivering. But you're absolutely correct. Uh, I do agree that uh, they are moving from the infancy in the field to some potentially uh, actionable developments. My take home message was pretty surprising to me, although it seems to be obvious. Uh, that we better find ways to increase a healthy lifespan because uh, some increase in longevity uh, is a function of development of society and it's inevitable. And because uh, demographic structure is changing towards uh, an increase of elderly population, uh, society cannot operate uh, simply economically in terms of supporting aged people. And therefore, we'd better find a way to make them fully functional and young and be able to contribute to society. So it becomes not only wishful thinking or individual desire to live longer, but a matter of uh, survival of our species on this stage of development. We have to find a way to increase healthy lifespan. Thank you. J just to, to answer uh, some of your uh, some of your uh, comments. Uh, uh, indeed, the main thing is, is to balance uh, the optimism uh, with, uh, with 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 reality. So uh, they're all uh, gr uh, all the grounds to be optimistic. Yes, uh, there is no law law in nature that uh, prohibits this possibility of extending life. But uh, on the way, there are many technical obstacles. Also. Uh, obstacles in, in our mutual even understanding. You know, uh, you will not uh, find uh, uh, two, probably will not find two gerontologists with the same methodology or with the same opinion. Precisely because the gerontology is, is, is such a, a vast subject because aging is such a vast uh, and, and complex process. Yes, uh, Aubrey and others selected uh, the, the magic number of seven or nine, but as I mentioned, it could be 77 on 777 of a process uh, because aging is, is basically uh, limitless. It depends on your on your on the angle on, on the part of the elephant you are looking at. I, I'm hoping even it's you know in the laws of, of dialectics, uh, uh, you have a situation when uh, quantity becomes quality. 
So, so I hope when the, the entire society is interested in the topics and more and more scientists uh, are interested that some kind of quantum leap will be made in our understanding. Uh, the, but for that, we'll advance step by step. I totally agree. If we take, uh, uh, if we look at the budget of NIH and uh, uh, compare the uh, uh, funds directed towards uh, studying of uh, basic causes of aging, basic mechanisms of aging, and compare them to money spent on uh, Alzheimer's disease as, a, as an isolated phenomenon without any relation to aging per se. It's like one to 10 or maybe one to 100. And majority of research in Alzheimer's is based on long premises or at least um, on not very perfect theories about the development of disease. And they, to me, it seems like a clear, obvious waste of resources. We need to uh, concentrate our efforts on our understanding of the aging process as a whole. And uh, I thank you for your amazing lecture. And uh, I hope that um, our listeners will embrace this point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.